Hey everyone, Ben Coomer Radio, episode number 244. The maths is back, I think it's right. Um, today we've got a cross-Atlantic show. I think America's across the Atlantic. I didn't really pay attention in geography school, but it doesn't matter because I paid attention in PT school and I did all right, and that's why I'm here. Um, today we have uh, a strength-based man. He likes to lift things, talk deadlifts, and that kind of stuff. And I'm actually going to ask him to present his own name because I had in my head how I was going to say it, and then I heard him say his name, and I was like, that was not how I was going to say your name. So, Tony, <laughs> hello, your name. Tony Gentlecore, and I want to hear what you were going to say. I'm very curious. Well, I was going to say <laughs> Tony Gentlecore, but... Uh, yeah, that's right. You're, that's on. Yeah, but when we did our sound test, you, you went like full American, and you kind of slurred <laughs> it a little bit, and I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure anymore. I don't back myself. No, no, you're you got it right on point. I, I was very happy with that pronunciation. Well done, well done. So, Tony, uh, dude, um, take the microphone. Uh, explain to everyone who you are and what do you do. Well, I luck as, as luck would have it, I am a geography master, and I will confirm that the United States is across the Atlantic Boom. of of the UK. <laughs> uh, I'm a strength coach. Uh, I've been in the industry since about 2002. Uh, started as a personal trainer at a bunch of commercial gyms back near my hometown in, in New York. Uh, about 2006, uh, I teamed up with a gentleman that many people might know, Eric Cressy, and he and I lived together for about two years. So while he was he was writing books and being smart and stuff, I was watching a lot of Lord of the Rings and uh, starting up starting a blog. Uh, but then we opened up Cressy Sports Performance in the summer of 2007, and I've been there. I was there from 2007 till 2015, and uh, training everyone from every walks of life. A lot of professional athletes, in particular, baseball players. Um, but you name somebody, their background, their injury history, we, we work with them. And uh, now I am doing my own thing in Boston. Uh, I have a, a small training studio called Core and uh, training a lot more general fitness people now, which kind of back to my roots and um, been really, really enjoying it. Like, uh, you know, there's, there's, that, there's kind of this connotation and, and sexiness about training professional athletes and it's great. Um, but it can wear on you sometimes. And, uh, you know, so it's been cool the past year or so, uh, getting back to my roots and, and working with more, uh, gen pop clients and helping them get strong and, uh, working on any injuries they may be trying to get past and movement dysfunctions and stuff like that. So, um, it's been great because my studio is about a mile from where I live in Boston, as opposed to driving out 45 minutes to Krusty Sports Performance. So, uh, yeah, having a good time, just I, I, getting people strong. I have no complaints. Uh, I can see why you went with the business name Core rather than Gentle Yeah, Core. see that? Yeah, <laughs> see? A little, a little branding. I, I, I learned a little bit from uh, my other business partner, Pete. Uh, he's kind of the branding guy for Krusty Sports Performance. So And Eric, too. But um, I, I, I took a little bit of their, of their insight and... Uh, fair calling my gym core would make things pretty seamless and easy. Mm. Um, so when you worked at Cressy Performance, I was uh, doing a little bit of digging around on your website and stuff, uh, doing a bit of background research, you know, trying to see if I could find anything dirty on people, see if I could, you know, hold you over a barrel in any way. No, <laughs> uh, I was trying to find out some cool stuff, and um, you said you had something called Techno Tuesday. Oh yeah, Cressy very very popular. So. Uh, you know, Eric and I are really good friends. We've known each other for over a decade, um, but we have very different tastes in music. <laughs> so uh, there was there was always like a, a fight of the stereo. Like he'd be playing um, Lincoln Lincoln Park, sometimes country, which is Ugh. I can't I cannot stand country. Um, and then on my on my end of the spectrum, it was techno, '90s hip hop. Um, so that tends to be my flavor. So there's a running joke at the facility that on Tuesdays uh, I would basically have rain, uh, I had the run of the stereo, and it'd be a lot of techno and, and stuff like that. So um, 
some people didn't care for it, but a lot of people did. So I don't know if they still do it. I doubt they do, but it'd be awesome if they did. <laughs> it would be like you are living on in the gym. Oh man, it was uh, my dream is to someday, you know, have strobe lights and you know black lights and people deadlifting to like, hopefully get like Tiesto spinning live. Um, I'm sure that'd be pretty cheap, you know, to hire him for an hour, but. Uh, you have, know, you, well, have you ever heard of a guy called Mark Fisher? Of course, I'm good friends with Mark. I was at his wedding. Well, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you know him way better than I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say his his gym sounds like there would be some strobe lights. You know, yeah. If there, uh, Mark Fisher Fitness, which is in New York yeah. City, um, is a you know I I always say that there is no more positive place to train. Than, at, than there, um, it's very it's very different in a good way. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's kind of R rated, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's uh, but yeah. Oh my God, they they have certain rooms where all they have are black lights and people wearing capes and you know listening to they'll they'll have like dance offs and playing Broadway music. It's crazy. It's a it's a very cool place to train. Nice. All right. Well, I suppose we should probably talk about something fitness related. Um, one of the things that you kind of have a big passion point around some of your writing and stuff is female fitness. And I think it's one yeah. of the areas that, you know, it's it's kind of had its stigmas around certain areas, like women should do certain things and men should do certain things. And there's always been a bit of a divide. And I'd say definitely over the last seven eight, to eight years, that has that divide has parted a lot more. And there's been a massive change in female fitness, but I suppose mm-hmm. what what is bubbling under the surface for you still or right now in female fitness that you kind of want to say? Do you know we we, we we need to change that? Yeah, I you know I can't say I disagree with you, Ben, because I do feel in the past five, six, seven years, uh, female fitness has gotten a little bit more um, hardcore, for lack of a better term. Um, we've kind of gotten away from this connotation that. The girls have to do this stuff over here. They have to have the girl specific area where it's ellipticals and light weights and machines and the guys can go over here and train with the barbells and dumbbells. Like that's more or less stopped. I know it still exists, but um, it's not nearly as profound as it used to be. And I do think we have to give a lot of the credit to CrossFit. Um, I think nothing has uh, gotten people more excited to train and work out with barbells and free weights. Um, than CrossFit, so I, I feel like we do need to kind of give them some kudos um, to that regard. But um, you know, there's still some work to be done. Like I think, you know, if you walk through your local grocery store or whatever, and you you walk past the magazine section, you look at the magazines geared towards women's fitness and the magazines geared towards men's fitness, you'll see a lot of different words. There's a, there's a huge dichotomy of the words you're to use. So you look at men's magazines and you'll see words like big, strong, mass, um, stuff like that. And you look at women's magazines and it's less, it's small, it's tight, it's loose, it's, it's dress size. And like they're kind of programmed to think that smaller is better. Um, and I think that's, that's bullshit. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think that's unfortunate. Um, you know, and it does play in, into the mindset and what what um, just their feelings towards muscle. Like they they're programmed to think that muscle is a bad thing and being having mass is a bad thing. Um, and that that's quite quite unfortunate. So you know, I try to do my best when because I do when I was at Cressy Sports Performance and even now I train a lot of female clients like. Um, I would say right now it's about 50, it's a 50, 50 split as far as the number of females I train and the number of males I train. And I just try not to make it a thing. Like I try not to make it like, oh, these are what the guys are going to do. And this is what the girls are going to do. Like the human body is the human body. Like, of course there's some minor, uh, differences that we could probably nitpick about with regards to training females and, and men, but I just try not to make it a thing. Like, you know, I'm going to do the assessment. Everyone goes through my assessment, and I and I'm going to try to gravitate them towards the big lifts: deadlift, squat, bench press, chin ups, rows. And if there's anything that I try to put a main focus on, especially with training women, is to get them to grasp onto the the importance of training for performance, 
and latching onto a performance-based goal. Because I find that if they do that, then they're not so concerned about the scale of weight. They're not like that isn't running their their progress. Like and you've probably been there too with some of the females you've trained in the past. They get so dead set on progress being being um, determined by what the scale is telling them. And I try to nip that in the bud. That's like no, we're going to focus on performance based goals. So whether that's you know performing your first unassisted chin up. Uh, doing a deadlift pain free, doing X number of push ups, whatever that, ca- whatever it is. If I get them to latch onto that kind of goal, it's funny because then a lot of the aesthetic stuff that they're after kind of just happens because they're training with purpose, they're training with intent. Um, you know, and it, it's so awesome to see when that light bulb switches on or the or the the switch turns it on. They they start like loving training with barbells and dumbbells and trying to put a little bit more weight on there. And, um, it's just a cool thing to, uh, to see happen. And, uh, so that, that's kind of like my general speech on, on female training. It's just, I, you know, there's, it's a lot better now compared to years ago. Um, but there's still a little work to be done. And, mm-hmm. um, but I, I just think the biggest thing is, um, not to make it a thing between male and female. And I, and I think a lot, a, a, another mistake that a lot of trainers and coaches make sometimes is, especially with training females, is they try to win or they try to be like, no, or like you're, you're interviewing a new female client. You try to say, oh, well, doing cardio is stupid and yoga is stupid. Like, I don't think those are stupid. I don't think that's the language you should be using. Um, you know, it's about educating them. Um, and, and hopefully empowering them, but trying to win a conversation and telling them, yeah, what you've been doing is really dumb and stupid. You're, you're going to do it my way from now on. I don't think that's, a, that's the right approach. But usually what I say is like, listen, give me 60 days, like two solid months of training. I'm going to write the program, cater to your needs, your goals, your weaknesses, et cetera. And give me 60 days. Follow the program for 60 days. And then we'll reassess and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. And how many, how many times do you think that I've had to have a, a, another conversation when we're trying to get them to latch on to how I want them to train? Zero. Because um, by the time 60 days comes around, they, they see that they're, they, they look better in, in, in their clothes. They feel better. Their confidence is up. Um, and that's kind of what I'm after is, is more of that mindset. Sure. Well, you've mentioned it now. You've loaded the gun, so let's fire it. There's <laughs> okay. Going be, there's going to be plenty of people that are actually interested to hear the nuances and kind of your opinion. You mentioned that, and I agree with you, largely males, females training pretty similar. What are some yeah. of the things that you would nitpick on? Yeah. I think, well, certainly, I think women generally can handle a little bit more volume just oh, really? because I do, yeah. Okay. Um, you know that I I found that they uh, you know just because of their 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 smaller um, you know and, and motor recruitment and stuff like that like I, I tend to find that they can they can handle a little bit more volume but that's not to say that I'm I'm loading them with volume right out of the gate like it regardless of if it's male or female if they're if they're a new person I'm working with um, I'm always going to be m- more cognizant of technique and make sure their techniques on point and because I'm not a fan of high rep deadlifts high rep squats anything of that nature. The accessory work is one thing, but if we're talking like the, the meat and potatoes of a program, uh, like deadlifts, for example, I rarely ever go above five reps just because I want I want every rep to be as immaculate as possible, especially in the beginning. Um, but I, I have found that women tend, tend to handle, can handle uh, a little bit more volume. And then you, you got you to gotta take in consideration too, um, you know, the monthly period, like certainly um, hormonally, there are certain times in the month where women are just not going to have the energy, they're going to be lethargic. Um, and you have to take that in consideration as far as like how you structure your monthly programming. So, you know, later in the month, you might they might need lower volume just because they don't feel good. So, um, and, and men, we don't have to be concerned about that for the most part outside of, you know, work and other related stress. But, um, but those are, those tend to be the, the slight nuances that, that, that I, I found training women that I, I, I try to pay a little bit more attention to. Okay. Interesting. And I, and I honestly, I think women are a lot easier to coach <laughs> and, uh, it's not to say that I don't enjoy training men. I do because I, I train a ton of men, but women don't take it as a stroke against their ego when you tell them to take some weight off the barbell. 
Mm-hmm. Like they're not, they're like they they want to do it right. They want to do it well. They they're learning. They're they're they just they they tend to listen a little bit better. Whereas you know sometimes, not all the time, of course, but sometimes you know I'll walk up to a, one of my athletes or one of my one of one of the males I train and say, hey, you know, it didn't look great. Let's take a little weight off the bar. And it's like, oh, like you could just see like their that deflated look. Like I just told, like I just kicked them in the nuts. Like no, I'm sorry, like sad, but I. It's just I want you to do it right. I don't want you to hurt yourself. So um, I have found that women tend to be a little bit more uh, open to constructive criticism um, than compared to men, and, and that that's just my observation. Like, and, that, and again, that's not to say that I don't enjoy training men because I do, um, but that, that it's just a it's just a an open observation on my end. I think in that regard, men can learn a lot from women. I'll draw an example. I train um, now and again at a commercial gym uh, and I don't see ever a single woman doing anything stupid with a heavy yeah. weight, ever. Like, they're never... Unless, unless, unless they're training with their boyfriend, then... <laughs> yeah. I, I, that, then you see, like, well, you can always tell that, like, when you have a couple training and, like, the, the guy's, like, very experienced and the woman isn't. And, like... I've seen that. That's always kind of comical to watch and sometimes cringeworthy. Um, but yeah, you're right. Like I, you know, my, my wife goes to the gym four times a week on her own and, you know, and of course I'm writing her programs and not to, not to, not to blow sunshine at my ass, but you know, she's doing things well and, um, and, but I, but she notices the same things you do. Like and that, and every now and then I go with her to the commercial gym and I think you're right on point. Like I just think women are more concerned about doing stuff right rather than, being drawn in the to, to the um, bravado and the and the the, the, t- the testosterone and trying to like lift more weight just to impress somebody. Yeah, I am. Um, I find it fascinating because uh, I'll quite often do certain stuff, and you'll see guys look at you and they'll they'll go, "Oh, I I expected him to lift more than that," and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, but bear in mind, I'm going ass to grass on my squat. I've got a yeah, pause yeah. at the bottom, like." And it is fascinating that yeah. men are just so singularly driven on output, like yeah. stressed output. It's always, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I guess I'm lucky in that I, I do live in this like strength and conditioning bubble, especially eight years of Cresty Sports Performance, now that I'm on my own, where, you know, people do stuff correctly, like they're coached well. Um, you know, we have to break bad habits and, you know, break people down and like break down movement and make sure they're doing it right. And, you know, I've had 10 years of being in that bubble. Um, but yeah, every time when I go, when I go to a commercial gym, which isn't often, but it's enough where, you know, it's a couple times a year where when I'm traveling or if my wife's off for, on vacation, I'll go with her to the gym. Um, you know, it's a, it's a comedy and it, it, it makes for a lot of, uh, blog content when I, when I go to a commercial gym, just because I do know it's hard for me to, I'm a coach. Like it's hard for me not to be in a room where people are lifting weights and not be observant. Mm -hmm. Um, and like just watch people and, and, and I'm not one of those people that gives unsolicited advice. Like I'm not one of those douches that walks over to somebody like, Hey, you know, you should do it this way. And like, I'm not that person, but I'm certainly watching people and what they're doing. And like, sometimes I'm like, Oh man, that doesn't look good. I'd love to be able to fix that. And other times like I give like a quiet nod where it's like, yeah, that's, that's legit. Good job. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm with you and that guys tend to be a little bit more, um, I don't know what the appropriate word I'm looking for here, like um, competitive, yeah. uh, trying to one up each other, um, and it, yeah, and I don't see that a lot of women. That's why that's why in a lot of ways, like training, when I have a room full, like a, a Monday nights at my facility tend to be um, women, my women night, where a lot, a lot of the women come in and train at the same time, um, and it's so much fun. Like you know, there's Beyonce radio blaring. And then they're just getting after it. They're squatting, they're deadlifting, they're doing chin-ups, and they're motivating each other. And, and they're not competitive in the, in the least. Like, if anything, they're just rooting each other on where, you know, guys – I mean, I think when you get a bunch of guys in the same room and friends and there's camaraderie, that the same thing applies. But in a commercial setting, I'm right there with you. It's, it's, quite, it's quite comical <laughs> to watch. Uh, it's like peacocks walking around, you know, with their, with their feathers ruffled out. Like, see who can, who can lift the most weight or who can look bigger. So, men, uh, let's learn something. Come on. Um, so, moving on, Tony, uh, I want to talk about shoulder and hip mobility because it's okay. something that you've recently explored in a book. You wrote a book with Dean Somerset 
yeah. focusing on the, the shoulder and the hip. Um, why do you think, I mean, I, I feel I know, uh, mainly because of its kind of connection points, but why do you feel the shoulder and the hips are so important in human movement? Well, they're just involved in everything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, particularly, yeah. I mean, particularly the hips, when you think about it, like nothing, nothing we do in the weight room doesn't involve the hips. I mean, even a bench press when you're lying on your back involves leg drive, mm-hmm. um, which forces being transferred through the hips. Um, but, you know, those tend to be, you know, we can talk about any joint, but the hips and shoulders more often than not tend to be the most vulnerable joints. Like there aren't many people who have been lifting weights for any uh, appropriate length of time or any lengthy length of time where there's, they've never had a shoulder injury, not injury, but like their shoulder hasn't been a little bit bummy and like, you no, know, I'll do some extra bench pressing kind of bothers it. And certainly hips too. Like people tend to sit on their butts all day. Mm-hmm. Their only form of movement is when they go to the gym but the rest of the day, they're sitting in front of a computer or in front of a TV. So, you know, those, those two joints are involved in 95, if not a hundred percent of movement. <laughs> so, uh, it just makes sense to, you know, when we're doing assessment to hone in on, on those two areas to see what kind of red flags is this? Like, does someone have the ability to bring their arms overhead without any major compensations? Like what are the shoulder blades actually doing? You know, like when I do a shoulder assessment and someone comes to me and they point to the front of their shoulder and say, my shoulder hurts here, which is usually a a, a telltale sign of external impingement or meatheaditis, which is like when guys are benching a lot and doing nothing but benching, their shoulder hurts. Um, Even if someone's pointing to the front of their shoulder, I'm more concerned about what their shoulder blades are doing because more often than not, even if it is a rotator cuff injury, the, the, the culprit is like what the shoulder blades are or are not doing. Like, is, do they have ample upward rotation? Are they set in the right spot? Um, you know, and what can I, like, do I see anything that might be a little bit wonky or weird? Um, and, what, and what correctives or modalities can I implement to help correct movement, which will then, you know, hopefully clean up their, their technique and, and take away some of their, their um, uh, pain when they when they do certain movements. Mm. Um, same thing with the hips. I mean, I definitely fall into the camp that there there is no one right way to coach a deadlift or to coach a squat. Like everyone is different. Like I wrote a I wrote an article not too long ago called textbook technique doesn't exist. So what you read in a textbook, like your foot should be your feet should be here, your hip width should be this, doesn't exist. Like everyone is different when we talk about leverages and you know, hip structure and bony structure, you know, some people are going to feel more comfortable with a wider stance, some people narrower, some people staggered. Depth is going to be indicative of how much hip flexion they have, how much ankle dorsiflexion flexion do they have. Um, and looking at someone's hips um, passively, like just doing like a, a general hip scour, just to see what range of motion they have on a table and to see if that matches what they have available when they stand on their two feet and they actually do a squat or a deadlift is important information to know as a coach, um, you know, because then that's going to dictate, okay, well, maybe this ver- this version or variation of deadlift that you've been doing isn't the right fit for your body types. So maybe we should do this instead. Or maybe astrograph squats aren't good for you because you just don't have the bony anatomy to go way down that way, mm-hmm. that low in your squat. So we're going to have to bring you up a little bit. And there's no there's no demerit points to that. Like, there's no medal you're going to win by by squatting ass to grass. You know, the internet likes to tell you that you have to do that or it doesn't count. Um, and I would disagree with that. Like, some people just aren't going to get there just because of their own bony anatomy. It's just their hips are not made or structured in a way that allows that. If they have access to it, of course, I'm going to use it. Like that, you know, of course. Um, but that's why that's why it's so important to assess hips and see how much hip flexion, hip extension, external and internal range of motion someone has, because that's gonna that's only gonna make your programming all the more effective. And hopefully not and hopefully keep people from getting injured. When I think about my own sort of gym programming and what I get out of it in terms of bang to buck, if there's one joint that I know that I have to stretch to actually get the most return on investment, it's always my hips. Sure. Yeah, Always I would agree. Hips. Yeah. I could not I mean, that, that everything is generated from the hips. Like, I, I mean, it, the hips are where it's at. It's at. So the center of bodies, your center of mass, like that's where everything's going to generate from. Um, 
Yeah, I would agree with you 100%. So just to get an insight into kind of how you look at the hips and make some generalizations, um, what kind of things do you generally do as a practitioner with a lot of your clients? Um, like, for example, do you find a lot of people are tight in their hip flexors, in their piriformis, and are they kind of like go-to like, you know, this is what I'm using in 70, 80, 90% of my clients? Yeah, um, you know, I think, yeah, hip flexors are always going to be a, a go-to just because people sit a lot and they tend to be stiff in that area. Um, but honestly, I, 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 in recent years, I find more and more that it isn't really so much about stretching people and, like, giving people more mobility, but a lot of people are just so unstable and weak that they perceive as tight. So a lot of times because they have such a weak core and they're not, they're not strong, everything tests as tight or the range of motion lacks because the body is putting the brakes on. The nervous system is kind of putting the brakes on the body because it doesn't want you to hurt yourself. It's, it's seeing you trying to access this range of motion, but because you're so unstable and weak, it's putting the brakes on. So someone is will feel tight or stuff perceives as tight. So a lot of times what I do is like, Okay, let's work on some positional breathing drills, get you to turn your core on, um, and, 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 and see if that helps. And a lot of times, I, I, I spend five minutes doing that, um, and I retest range of motion in their hips, and I see an improvement. And that's just because I got the nervous system to chill, chill out, like, it, it turned off the brakes, and now we got more range of motion, and then I can take that and say, okay, let's stand up, let's get you to learn to brace accordingly, you know, turn your abs on, and, and, and keep that stability and pull yourself down into a deep squat position under control. Um, and that a lot of times it works like magic. Like it's like, it's like night and day, you know, beginning of a session towards the end of a session, you know, people will test very poorly in the beginning and I just get them to get like work on some stability drills. And then by the end of the session, their, their, their range of motions, like, 90% better. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, so, and that's not to say that people aren't tight. They certainly are. And, and that we, that there isn't some, uh, uh, validity in doing some stretching and some dedicated mobility work. Of course there is. Mm -hmm. Um, but I find a lot of the time the culprit is just people are very unstable and, and they're just weak. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you fix that, you know, there's a saying in the industry, well, if you, if you, if you build proximal stability to so get their core get their core stronger, you're gonna you're gonna gain access to distal mobility. So then you're gonna you're gonna see better mobility. So um, you know I'm much more I tend to go down that route avenue, um, but that's that's why it's so important to do a thorough assessment because what what can be perceived as tight or lack of mobility. You know, if you just do the table assessment, oh yeah, you, you, your hips are really tight. We got to work on mobility drills. And you don't dig a little bit deeper, you're barking up the wrong tree. Because then all you're doing as a coach is you're you're programming all these various mobility drills and stretches, which is just making them, which is just feeding into the problem to begin with. Mm -hmm. Whereas you know you should be working on more core stability, dead bugs, dead bugs, bird dogs, like pal off presses, working on their squat patterning, working on their hip hinge getting them more stable and then that is going to get them more range of motion and improve their mobility. So, um, that's kind of, the, that's kind of how I approach my assessment. So for people that want to kind of explore what you've just said, is there a kind of a couple of go-to places on YouTube that you recommend to kind yeah. of look at some of this stuff? Well, I think, I mean, you know, I think my Nadine's, uh, digital product, our, our complete shoulder and hip blueprint, what goes into that, like I spent an entire it's a it's a it's a, a, a workshop that we filmed when we were over in Europe. So I spend day I spent an entire day talking about shoulders. Dean spends an entire entire day talking about hips. And we talk about assessment, we talk about correctives, and we talk about we break down movement, how to regress and progress certain movements and exercises. Um, and really hammer home the, the idea of stability and how important that is for people and improving their movement. Um, so I think that would be a um, you know, of course, in a, a, a biased opinion, but I think it's a good product. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, too, um, anything, you know, Greg Cook talks about it all the time with the FMS stuff. And Dean, Dean has a ton of uh, free YouTube videos talking about the same thing on his, on his YouTube page. I do as well. Um, you know, I, yeah, it's not hard to find. So I think if you just go to our YouTube pages and our respective websites, you'll, you'll find plenty of information on that. 
Nice. Um, all right, well, uh, wrapping up on this final question, I'm always intrigued to ask, ask strength coaches this because I'm a big fan of, you know, getting people to a place where they're doing fitness for the right reasons for them and it just being of complete benefit to their lifestyle, it never really becoming obsessive or a chore or anything like that. And if it means just going to the gym twice a week, then that is cool. And there's you know, there's no pressure there from us as coaches going, oh, you should be doing more, because really that's just what the person wants to do. So um, if someone was going to go to the gym twice a week, what would you want to see in their program to just make their time in the gym? Let's just say they've got two hours. What in their programming would you have in as a coach? Well, I, I, I definitely would approach it in the mindset of like trying to get them to latch on to a performance goal. So, okay, let's not just go to the gym to go to the gym, but what are we working towards here? And then and the program is, is going to emulate that or be designed for that. So um, twice a week, I would say – you know, I, as a strength coach, I, I'd be remiss not to put my focus more on the big three. So squat, deadlift, bench. Um, but I think I still think there's a there's a there should be a priority on relative strength too. So chin ups. I think chin ups are to me. If you know, even if if I had to pick between bench press and chin up, I would rather somebody be more proficient in their chin up than their bench press. Um, you know, not that I like to use this word all too often, but it, I, I tend to, it's, fine, it's more functional um, to, to real life events like doing a chin up and it's just relative strength is huge. Um, but it would be a full body approach, making sure that each day begins with a main movement, so whether it's a deadlift or a squat or a bench. Um, and then it's their accessory movements are just going to be dictated towards a technique flaw or a weakness in those lifts. So again, the accessory work has a purpose. They're not just there to do them. Like they, they're serving some kind of, they're, they're addressing a weakness or a technique flaw. And then, you know, honestly, I find I get a lot more, I get more people jazz up the train when I give them, like for guys, for example, they love it when I say, okay, last five or 10 minutes is gun show. We're just gonna we're just gonna hammer your arms for five or ten minutes. Like they love that. Like and I give them a choice. I think if the more choice you give people, like we can either do this or we can do that, you know. And then it, it, they're gonna be more invested in that and it right there. So um, you know, I think at the end of the session, as long as, they, as long as they get done what I feel is important, what's geared towards their goals and keeping them from getting injured, um, you know, and then giving them like a five or ten minute window where it's like, okay, here we go. Let's have like. Women want to work on their glutes, we'll do that. Men want to work on their arms, let's do that, and then and then we'll be good to go. So they finish their they finish their workout on a uh, on a high note and stuff that they that's fun and that they want to do. I like that psychologically. I really like that, and I can't disagree with the fact that I love a little gun bash. Yeah, uh, myself. can't go wrong there. Can't go wrong there. Um, Tony, thank you very much for coming on the show and sharing some insight with us. Uh, I'd love for people to be able to go and find you, explore your work. You've written extensively. You've got some cool products. Where where do you want to send people from today? That would be home base for me is my uh, my website tonygenocore.com. So that is my blog. It links to every article I've ever written, uh, all the podcasts I've been on. So this one will go on there. Um, Twitter, Facebook, everything it's on there. So I would I would encourage people to visit that if they so choose. Nice. Well, you've heard it. Go and uh, check out uh, Tony's website, Tony Gentle Core. It is spelled as you would. Uh, oh no, it's not actually, is it? It's G E N T I L L Core. Yep. 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 You got it. We got it. Um, <laughs> and I've only got it because every time I typed it into Word today, as I was doing my notes, I was very conscious of make sure it's the right spelling. Ah. Sure it's the right yeah. Spelling. Um, so if you've enjoyed today. Uh, speak to us on Twitter, make a comment on Facebook, You know, send uh, Tony a message, reach out. We're putting ourselves out here to help you guys uh, and I hope you've enjoyed the show. If there's something in the show where you think, Do you know what, I'd love to speak to Tony more about that, give him a tweet, give him a message. Yeah, like That is the idea of what we do. Um, so Tony, thank you again for being on the show. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. And for all of you listening, um, thank you for giving me your ears for another week. Now, I haven't told you this yet because I just keep forgetting, 
But my uh, new book, How to Be an Awesome Personal Trainer, has actually been on Amazon for a couple of weeks now. I just forgot to tell everyone. Uh, we ordered some books. We sold out. So I thought I better not mention it on the podcast in case we sell out again. But anyway, we've now got an ebook. We've now got Kindle. We've now got um, it. Amazon again and then hopefully we'll have an audio book again soon so how to be an awesome personal trainer is now on Amazon thank you and I'll speak to you all again next week stay awesome hey everyone Ben Coo Radio episode number 243 now we talk